previous videos, the Department of Homeland Security has covered operational steps to respond to an active shooter event. But what about those communities who cannot run, hide, or fight? In this video, we look at the access and functional needs community, including the deaf and hard of hearing, blind persons, those with physical disabilities, and others who may not be able to take directions immediately in crisis, such as children or those with developmental processing disabilities. Around the United States, teachers like Travis Spillers deal with these types of challenges every day. Teaching in elementary school, um, it's it's challenging to explain to kids what these scenarios are, especially if you go through a hard lockdown drill or um, just a fire drill. And then you have kids, like I've taught kids with, that were on the autism spectrum that had sensory issues. And to, trying to explain to them, hey, this is just a drill, we're just practicing. We would always prep them uh, verbally uh, ahead and we'd, we'd, we'd take our practices before the fire drill would happen. We request typically that the administration let us know when there's a fire drill or if there's going to be a hard lockdown or a practice or a bus drill, something like that. But it's for kids especially that have communication issues to, to try to communicate back and forth to them during a hard lockdown drill, is, um, it, it can be really challenging. I mean, a lot of them will pick up on their peers and understand like we're sitting in the corner and we're hiding, but uh, you know, to try to explain the enormity of it, if it were a real scenario, could be could be challenging. One of the things we need to do, besides telling people that they should run, hide, or fight, is what to do when they can't. What to do to assist somebody else who may not be able to. You really need to have at the table people representing a wide variety of the population. You think you know who works for you. You don't necessarily know who's coming through these kinds of public places. This is why you need to engage your folks locally because it's such a wide variety of different things depending on the particular issue. There's a natural human tendency to want to try and make sure that we take care of everybody. If we haven't prepared in advance for someone, for example, who's deaf or someone who's blind or someone who can't hide, we're going to probably put not only them at risk, but the people that decide they want to stay back and try and save them. Ty Williams understands these challenges all too well. Paralyzed by a college football injury, Ty says he's not helpless, but that learnable techniques like the two-man lift can enable bystanders to assist him in an evacuation without risking their lives. But it's important that people know how to do that. Because, I mean, I've been through it myself, just trying to talk to my friends through it and sometimes, and they're just very cautious because they, they kind of think like you're fragile and whatnot because you're in a chair, so they're kind of like, like he very hesitant about things. The really important thing to understand about civil rights and civil liberties and preparedness is it isn't just legally required, it's the right thing to do. Minutes away from Cameron Quinn's office is Gallaudet University, the first school for advanced education of the deaf and hard of hearing in the world. Run by Ted Barron, the Gallaudet Security Division focuses on incorporating alternative warning methods for a campus predominantly occupied by students who cannot hear a traditional alert or siren. Our biggest concern is how do we communicate these things out? How do we make sure that the student body or the, the campus is, is made aware? And that's our biggest challenge. How are they going to respond to law enforcement? How is law enforcement going to respond to them? Because um, there's a lot of quick communication that takes place there. We try to tell them what, th what they should expect on their end as far as you may not get a reaction. You may get a reaction that you don't expect to get. But we also try to communicate that on our end as well. And we tell them that you, when there is law enforcement response, you know, do these following things just so that you, you know, you're, you're cooperating or you're appearing to cooperate. So there's just so many little things that get overlooked. And that's, that's unfortunate. What I've learned is, is you really have to take kind of the 10,000 foot view and say, I've never met a deaf person before in my life, so now what do I need to do? I think the technology that we're using, um, our K through 12 is using a, a wonderful technology where they have a, um, an actual ASL video, visual emergency, emergency communication system, which is nice. They have, they have pre-canned messages that they can just pop up, just, you know, if there's a fire drill, an ASL message comes up on the on video screens that are strategically located in the school. We can send out a message through the desktop, but if somebody's not near a desktop, um, we, we have cable TV takeover as well, which is basically equivalent to an emergency broadcasting system that you see on television. We have that here. And then we utilize a, uh, a separate system that taps into email and SMS. And that's pretty reliable. That information gets out there pretty quickly. So they rely on their personal devices just like, a, just like the hearing community does, but we 
solely rely on that. And we can actually localize some of these um, some of these messages. So if there is a suspicious person in the in the academic building, we can specify, we can send a message that says to that building, say there's a suspicious person in this building, lock your building down, while we can send a message out to the rest of the community that says, shelter in place, do not enter, or messages that are related to any Cleary crime, which means that any crime on campus or, or near the campus, which gets them used to looking at the device when it, when it pops up and you see a message from the Department of Public Safety, so it's nice um, when, it, when we really need it. Um, hopefully they'll be comfortable enough to utilize that. One thing that I've done in all of my classes is we teach a curriculum um, uh, for mindfulness. And we talk about the amygdala, which is our security guard and is there to keep us safe. And that's, that's a really good way for them to understand um, uh, what, what it is that's going on in their brains too when that happens. So we, we, when we do our mindfulness exercises, we're getting the amygdala to calm down. We're letting, we're letting the amygdala know that we're in a safe place, you know, in the school. That seemed to work really well when we had to do um, the hard lockdown drills. I, I keep referring back to the hard lockdown drills because that's where I, I feel like the, the biggest concern would be just trying to remain calm and in in, in, in hidden away. We have all sorts of problems. There could be, <laughs> there could be a lot of running, you know, uh, in, 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 in not a good way um, and hiding and fighting. I mean, I can't, we can't say, hey, you, can you quiet down the fire drill a little bit more? Or can you stop the strobe light in this hall because it triggers a kid? You know, I, I would imagine they're necessary for the rest of the population. If you can't hear, you're going to need to see something. Um, but if you have really bad epilepsy and you're walking out into a hallway and there's a strobe light there, that creates a problem too, you know? Other problems, yeah, if we have to be quiet because there's an active shooter in the in the hallway. I have had a couple of kids over the years that that do not have they have involuntary noises that they make. If we're in a lockdown for any length of time, we have kids with diabetes that you know may need I they mean need to go to the nurse to get their in, insulin regularly or I had a kid that needed to be catheterized. And uh, if we can't do that, you know, that could also have severe implications for him. If we're stuck inside of a classroom, we, we could have some serious issues, some potentially deadly issues, you know. And I think a lot of that burden just, it just ends up falling back on us special education teachers to figure out exactly what each student needs on the way out the door in an emergency. It goes without saying, it, it stinks to even have to think about this, this stuff, because I want to concentrate on serving our kids the best I possibly can and giving them the best education that they can so they can grow up and be productive citizens, you know, so. The access and functional needs community is diverse, and the challenge of preparing for a disaster or active shooter attack is daunting for any facility or organization. Preparing for the needs of this community may seem challenging, but there are grants, organizations, and federal documents available to assist groups of all sizes integrate these considerations into their preparedness strategies. For more information, please visit the resources found at cisa.gov.